wait, wait till new. We got a few more seconds. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to a new room and a new term. Uh, thrilled to have everybody here for the weekly Cyber Policy Center lunch. Uh, and uh, we couldn't start it off with a better speaker, our own Maricha Schake. Uh, and Maricha joined us uh, early on here in the Cyber Policy Center. We share her with HAI. She's the International Policy Director here at uh, the Cyber Policy Center. Um, uh, she's, known to, she, she's been introduced many times on this uh, campus, but has been for many years uh, at the forefront of policy in the EU related to uh, tech governance, but also in many other areas, uh, such as international trade, and, and um, uh, she was the, uh, led the delegation to observe the Kenyan elections, uh, and, and was a member of the European Parliament for many years from the Netherlands. Um, she'll be speaking today, though, about one of her newest roles, which is uh, in, on the advisory body to the UN on AI. And so the title of this talk is The Global Quest uh, for AI Governance. Um, as in all of our talks, uh, she'll talk for a, a little bit, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions both for those who are online and, and those who are in the room. Uh, those who are online, you can just put the questions in the Q&A and they will magically appear on my cell phone here as we have a conversation. So please join me in welcoming Maricha Schaffer. Thank you very much, Nate, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. I want to zoom out today. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Florence Giselle, who was zooming in in great detail uh, on how the EU AI Act looks uh, from a legal point of view what we might expect. Uh, today we're going to zoom out and take a very brief scan around the world to look at how many AI governance initiatives are there. But then we will focus specifically on uh, the UN AI advisory body because I'm a member of the body and uh, the goal today was to give a bit of a view behind the scenes of what is being discussed there and also what the added value of the United Nations in this big cacophony of initiatives can be. So I hope we'll get some clarity on that. So you can see uh, AI governance is everywhere. There's literally not a um, national government, multilateral organization, or even local government, or even university or hospital, that is not trying to wrestle with the question, what should we do with artificial intelligence? And in my time as an elected official, but also as studying the field of tech governance, I have never seen a momentum <clears throat> where so many people around the world are asking themselves the same question, how should we govern AI? And I think it's a real watershed moment to see that governments are stepping up, especially compared to the social media space where a lot of people in this room have spent a lot of time looking at, you know, should there be oversight and accountability? Should there be governance? Uh, should it be by companies? Should it be by um, elected and democratic governments? This discussion is still ongoing. And if you look at what has happened around AI within about a year, year and a half, governments have, have taken a multitude uh, of initiatives um, that we will look at a little bit today. So we see it everywhere from the local to the global level. Um, and on the one hand, it's important to recognize that there are competing visions and systems most obviously articulated in the Chinese versus the US model, but really everywhere. Even, I was a little surprised by that, between the UK and the US when the UK hosted its AI Safety Summit. It proudly announced the creation of an AI Safety Institute, and three minutes later, US Vice President Kamala Harris announced a US AI Safety Institute. Uh, and there was really a bit of a sort of uh, whisper in the room because from two allied countries, it seemed a bit strange that both of them would seek this high visibility platform to announce two separate efforts. And uh, on this slide, you can see that the headline from yesterday is that they sign an agreement to work together. So uh, there's, there's both efforts to collaborate, but there's also clearly 
uh, a lot of ambition on the part of governments and multilateral organizations to do it their own way in their own political image, uh, and that is uh, very understandable. Now, so far, the majority of efforts are non-binding. So they are articulations of principle, codes of conduct, as in the case of the G7, uh, political statements, but besides the Chinese rules on AI, in the democratic world, the EU is the only bloc that has chosen to adopt legally binding rules. And so it will be really interesting space to watch to see what the difference is, uh, whether AI companies will equally, equally seek to comply with soft law or uh, commitments to voluntary principles or whether it will really matter that there is a stick in one jurisdiction and not as much uh, in another. At least I'm curious to see that. So, so far we have seen little effort on enforcement and more on, you know, what is it that we want to agree on um, where we see a strong focus on risk, governments seeking to, to assess AI models for national security risk, uh, national disasters, or other kinds of major fallout, but also a question of how broadly defined can risk be. When it's not yet clear, you know, is a risk to democratic elections a national risk or not? Um, how must we think about discrimination, for example, or violations of human rights? Will governments consider those to be risks of AI, or will they seek a more narrow definition of risks in the space of uh, national security. And I've heard people uh, trying to juxtapose a risk-based approach versus a rights-based approach. Of course, these can play out differently, but in the case of the EU AI Act, for example, risk is articulated in the form of rights violations. So, for example, if an AI system is used to scan people's CVs, then it can have an impact on people's rights to employment or for a hot topic now, college admissions, it can impact someone's right to education. And so in the case of the EU, we see a convergence between a risk and a rights-based approach. And I think that's a good thing because it would be unfortunate if uh, risks and rights are seen as two completely different things when they are so uh, entwined, I think particularly in the way AI operates with the use of so much data, for example, and impacts on people's lives. Now, the risks that governments see on the one hand come from specific characteristics of AI as a technology, the fact that it is ever-changing, the fact that the uh, impacts are highly individualized, so what each of us may experience in interacting with an AI application can be completely different, and so the effect may be harmful in one case and completely harmless in the other case, and that's a challenge. But there's also a real recognition that I also think is unique for this discussion about AI governance, that companies have enormous power and that that power needs to be balanced for the public interest, for accountability and oversight. So that's a trend that I see through the various uh, AI governance in initiatives internationally. Now the question today is, uh, what added value can the United Nations bring in a space that's already very crowded? I've just listed a couple, but um, not only within the UN system, are there many organizations that are already governing parts of how AI impacts the media or standards or uh, disarmament or children, for example. Uh, but we also have new efforts like the Global Digital Compact, which is uh, another UN Secretary General initiative that will come to a conclusion in the fall, as will the UN AI advisory body that I serve on. Also outside of the UN, there's the OECD and the Global Partnership on AI, the EU with its law, the US with its executive order, the Council of Europe with a new uh, set of principles on AI governance, the African Union has a white paper, China has laws, Brazil is making AI law. I mean, it's, it's really a very happening and competitive space. And then of course, there are many efforts by industry to adopt standards themselves, aside from what governments may impose through um, either soft or hard law. Nevertheless, uh, the UN Secretary General believes firmly that there is a need for a truly global 
AI initiative, and that's what we are advising him on. And when I say we, I mean 39 experts that are from around the world and with different professional backgrounds, some from academia, some in government or former government, the private sector, civil society, coming from all corners of the world, literally. And our mandate is about one year long. So um, when I heard this, uh, as I got the invitation to join in early November and understood that we were to deliver an interim report before Christmas, uh, I blinked for a moment, but of course would never complain that the UN is acting too quickly. So um, we just went along with it and uh, dove right in. So the interim report is out. We are now in a consultation phase and it is called Governing AI for Humanity, another beautiful uh, lofty title, but I do encourage you all to read it. I think it is uh, worth it. It's only 20 pages, which is short as far as reports go, uh, but I'll give you some highlights today. It begins with the recognition that governance is a precondition for innovation and does not have to be seen as a hindrance to innovation, which is a frame we often hear, especially here in Silicon Valley. Uh, and that in order for the opportunities, the best use of AI, but also risk mitigation to be done well, we need governance. And we also need global governance. And the UN has a unique role in its global legitimacy. And the work of the advisory body focuses specifically on sort of correcting the imbalance where people in the global south various communities and their lived experiences have not been sufficiently uh, taken on board when thinking through what these communities need, how their interactions with AI might play out in specific contexts, and how their voices can be a stronger part of global AI governance questions. So you'll see a strong focus on what capacity does the Global South need, just a data point that basically no country in the Global South has supercomputing capabilities right now. Uh, and so that impacts questions of, of access, of participation, um, and of, of inequality, which is obviously a big concern. Uh, the question of access is a big concern, but also of how to make sure that governments are ready to participate in AI policy discussions, even if these technologies or sectors are, are not yet developed in the countries that they lead. You'll also see a very strong focus on the sustainable development goals where there's a hope that with the right governance, the SDGs can be advanced thanks to artificial intelligence applications. The other thing that comes through very strongly in the interim report is the anchoring of AI governance in universal human rights and international law. And I was personally very happy to see that the advisory body agreed on this because it's obviously not a discussion that is uh, universally embraced, in fact, very contested globally. Are human rights universal? Does international law apply? So I think it's a really uh, wonderful step that the diverse AI advisory body actually takes this as the foundation uh, tied to the legitimacy of the UN through the UN Charter, which is, of course, it's foundational document and it would be great if it doesn't have to be renegotiated in today's geopolitical climate. Um, AI governance um, through the UN, this is more my personal reflection, but should be seen as an opportunity to create a bottom line that all governments but also companies will have to respect when they develop AI applications and surely there may be governments that want to go over, be more ambitious, more rights protecting, um, you know, be more hands-on. But if we can create a bottom line that countries and companies don't fall under, this would be a huge achievement, especially if it would be taken up globally. Um, the global approach would, of course, avoid policy fragmentation, which is happening as we speak, and is something that companies don't appreciate either because they have to adhere to different standards wherever they want to operate. So harmonization is good for everybody, uh, if it can be agreed by everybody. The interim report recognizes that there should be accountability for both companies and governments, but has so far focused mostly on what functions we want to see instead of what institutions should be uh, performing those functions. 
So for those of you who may be following the debate on global AI governance, you may have heard proposals about a CERN for AI or an IAEA for AI, which as a non-English speaker is a challenge, uh, <laughs> IAEA for AI. Um, but the idea is really let's focus first on what it is we need and then on how it gets operationalized instead of starting to announce institutions without the proper thinking or legal basis uh, to substantiate it. Uh, but the next step is, of course, to think about what form these functions should take. And we're now um, concluding, roughly speaking, the input round. So we've heard input from government, civil society, but also UN organizations, companies around the world, as well as academics. So if anyone feels the urge uh, after today, please send in your comments. They are highly appreciated. Now, next steps, and I'll uh, end with those before we have a more interactive part of the session. Um, I'm curious to see whether we can maintain broad support, which we have felt for the interim report, as we have to start filling in what form some of these key roles of AI governance for the UN will take. Um, it's a big question whether all member states can be brought on board because the UN is nothing without its member states and uh, we need to only uh, look every day in the news to understand how divided the world is unfortunately today and the same is true for AI governance. And with the proposal of any new institution or any investment, for example, for capacity building in the global south comes the question of who pays and that is usually also uh, somewhat controversial. Governments are not keen to uh, spend millions if not billions on new functions even if it's very important. I already see a dynamic where a government may be widely supporting the interim report and the UN process for AI governance, but wants it to be more in the mirror image of the very initiative that it's already taken. So the question is how willing will different governments be to sort of overcome their specific national project, their safety institute, their uh, investor states uh, are up to, to implement uh, the core recommendations. And then a big question is, you know, when it comes to resources, when it comes to standards, when it comes to uh, research, can we avoid that some of the proposals for global AI governance are captured by companies which uh, are so powerful in the space of AI? So we're roughly midway since we started in early November and we end in September at the Summit for the Future with our final report. So I think it's a good moment to discuss, hear your views, hear the views from people online and uh, see what everybody thinks. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, and those of you online, put your questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll, uh, people have questions here, uh, raise your hand. Let, let, me, let me start with the, uh, the question that you sort of anticipated, which is what is the model um, for governance here? And whether, whether it's the IAEA or, or GATT or WTO or whatever, how are you thinking about that? Like what, what should it look like? Is, is it, does it require a whole new way of thinking about global governance here? Or, or are there models that you think might be applicable? Yes. Um, there are two parts of your question about what a good model for global governance is. On the one hand, I believe we need open-ended regulatory or governance solutions that can anticipate the fact that AI and other technologies will bring unexpected you know, new developments down the road in one, five, ten years. So governance initiatives need to be able to absorb those changes. On the other hand, is there one institution that would be the perfect place to house UN AI governance? I would say no. Um, we have looked at a number of potential directions. For example, do we need trusted global research into the capabilities and risks of AI that people can resort to? And that would break through this moment of almost tribalism in the AI mm -hmm. uh, community about you know, what is risk 
what are the capacities of these models that we must anticipate? So can we, can we find one sort of research base? There are questions about standards, which is a whole different ballgame. It's very specialized. There are organizations that are dealing with standards, so maybe the AI stuff can be housed there. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are good organizations within the UN and outside the UN that deal with respect for human rights, for example, but you know, do they have the capacity to uh, deal with AI? Not, not today. So if that sort of function would be housed there, they would need to hire talent, get a new mandate, um, deal, deal with their sort of core function of respect for human rights in new ways. So I am not at a point where I think we have a, a golden formula for one institution, but we will probably see a sort of um, housing of pieces of the puzzle with potentially some new organizations, uh, but also as much as possible housing it within places that are already well equipped. I, I mean, the reason I ask that question is that I, I sort of struggle with the question about what global governance of this particular family of technologies looks like, right? Because it is so, it's so many different things and it's basically going to be part of, you know, every aspect of our digital and sometimes non-digital lives. Um, <coughs> but I, in thinking about the UN in particular, I, I tend to think that the UN is most successful in, um, you know, it seems tautological, but bringing a global perspective to these issues, particularly with including voices from the global south. And so, in your experience now with this pretty large body that you're, you're dealing with, uh, you mentioned some of the resource questions like the lack of supercomputing in, in the global south. That, so that's, an, that's the kind of thing I'm asking you about. Mm -hmm. What divisions do you see between the different countries in the way that they're thinking about this um, that would be sort of good for us to hear? Yes, so I think it's good to keep in mind that the advisory body does not consist of countries. Right, it consists well, they're, of but they're from people from around the world, yeah. Yes, yeah. they are, but, but I think the very good news is that they don't come representing their country and not even representing their professional home base. Mm -hmm. So I've heard people who work at big AI companies taking positions that were different from uh, the official lines that these companies might take in public. Uh, I've heard people from countries where you might expect a strong vision on one side, take a completely different perspective. So uh, hopefully the sort of sense of um, what can the UN best do is the leading motive for people on the advisory body instead of I want my three points to be reflected yeah. and I hope we can keep it that way. But of course, um, there's already competition about creating capacity and infrastructure in the global south. I mean, China is investing heavily in IT infrastructure. Uh, the EU has a whole new uh, program, the Global Gateway. The US uh, has companies that are operating in, in the global south everywhere. Uh, so it's a competitive space already if you look at um, anything from, from telecoms infrastructure to undersea cables to uh, cybersecurity. This is ongoing and a lot of the AI companies are uh, similar, like you know, social media companies that are already there, uh, powerful infrastructure companies like AWS, for example, would also probably want to participate in this whole AI uh, development space. So in that sense, I think we will have to deal with some of the legacy competition. Mm -hmm. And then the question of, you know, what does investment in global public digital infrastructure look like? And that might be a fund that combines public and private resources, but with a public purpose, which I think might be the only way to leverage the kind of investments that are needed to bring people in the global south closer to the AI capabilities that are so sought after uh, in, in the developed world. Because the challenge is enormous. Uh, we, we, at some point in the advisory body, had a whole discussion about AI for the global south, and somebody was like, um, question, a lot of people don't have electricity in the global south? <laughs> like, how do you imagine we even begin to deal with AI? And so, I also want to caution against thinking about the global south as one, because yeah, there's huge yeah. variation in, in needs and, and levels of development, so it's a huge challenge, and I, uh, I don't think we're there yet, but the intention to make sure that this is a more of an equalizer, and that the results of UN efforts would help to overcome some of these divides are very clear. Well, I think part of the, the uniqueness in this domain, right, is that you've got sort of public and private players uh, in the AI space. So you have governments that are developing their own LLMs, right, as well as, of course, private players. And then it, it's not clear to me, for instance, that, that um, 
that the way forward is that all right, every country gets its own LLM or something like that, right? And so you can think about the infrastructure just being available uh, to folks, or or that the models are, um, and that sort of leads me to the what would be one of the unique characteristics here that dis distinguishes it from um, uh, social media, which is the open source, closed source question that we always, every, every AI uh, discussion that we have here in the Cyber Policy Center, eventually we get this question, right? Which is, um, th there is certainly a view that the uh, open sourcing or open, you know, models with open weights, as we say here at Stanford, um, that that is an empowering sort of development when it comes to AI and that uh, particularly for the low resource nations or, or, or uh, you know, companies that are working there, trying, starting, uh, wanting to start up, that they, I might think that that that, that would be a, a global geopolitical division is that the, those countries would want more open source as opposed to having the open AIs and Anthropics of the world, let alone the Googles and uh, Microsofts, uh, being the ones who who dictate policy there. Do you see any any sort of uh, seeds of those that kind of thinking having a geopolitical flavor to it? Um, so far in the advisory body, not as much because there's equal concern about risks associated right. with uh, with open models. So it's just a lively debate about, you know, should we see this as an opportunity? Should we see this as a risk? And I also think that the nuts, nuts and bolts discussion is still very much alive. So it's not only about the models, but also about the data, about the compute, about the talent, about uh, how to combine all these ingredients in an ecosystem that can work for people that are local. Because there's a lot of appreciation, and I, I think that's also very important to acknowledge here, you know, in the middle of Silicon Valley, that a lot of the models of development of AI are very extractive in the terms of labor that goes into it, mm -hmm. uh, that is often outsourced to very poor communities, uh, but also resources uh, for the whole tech development. And so this notion that this should be uh, empowering in a in a bottom-up way instead of being sort of facilitated in the old-school more colonial development ways is very much appreciated but at the same time no one can escape the global competition for hardware for example I mean not even here can companies uh, manage to get the the super computing chips that they would like to get their hands on so how can we even begin to imagine you know, freeing up that capability for others to be to be accessible. So I think it's an enormous quest that we're still in the in the middle of. But those aspects of who benefits, who decides, on whose terms, uh, for whom, is very much alive. And I, I think, rightly so. I think we should all focus much more on the voice and lived experience of people in the global south. It's the majority of people in the world. Uh, a lot of them don't live in democratic societies. Uh, we have to really think about what these AI applications that may be tested somewhat here can mean in different contexts for good and for bad. So one focus of the, of the uh, report, as you mentioned, is adopting a human rights framework. So I want to signal I'm a skeptic here a little bit, uh, but not just in this domain. Um, um, when it comes to the application of human rights frameworks to the, this kind of development of private technology, but but I want to be persuaded. And so, tell me what does a human rights, an international human rights framework, bring to the table here, um, in terms of, like. Y y Aside from just thinking about risks generally, I mean, obviously nobody. Yeah, it, there's a human rights problem if someone you know develops a bioweapon through the use of LLM, but it's a problem in all kinds of other ways too. And so, uh, what is it about like the, adopting a human rights framework here that that you think might be helpful? Well, if you look at governance um, as well as this global perspective, it is very tempting to think about bringing infrastructure to the global south, but not policy infrastructure. Um, while in a lot of countries, there is no data protection law. I mean, unfortunately, there is none in the US either. Um, but certainly in the global south, this is often missing. And so if you begin to, on the one hand, advance the rollout of these more advanced technologies without considering the protections for the people that are needed, or the protections for the electoral process, or the protections um, against disinformation or discrimination or uh, disenfranchisement of people, then you're not doing your job. So I think what the best we can do as, as members of this advisory body is to 
make this a more comprehensive notion of governance um, and to tie, for example, notions of investment in infrastructure to investment in policy that respects universal human rights. So that, and this is often forgotten, right? I think both the US and the EU are to blame for having focused mostly on getting, getting people connected, but not so much the conditions under, under which they get connected. And you mentioned um, that I led the election observation mission to Kenya in 2017. It's a really good example where this was a low trust society that had a long history of electoral violence, um, strong divisions between different ethnicities, lots of tension, and uh, also a history of election rigging. And so people were, were believing that by digitizing the elections, they would make them more fraud proof because they had seen you know, ballot stuffing where all kinds of pre-stamped ballots had been put in ballot boxes. So there was this belief that took hold that digitizing the election would increase people's democratic rights uh, when in fact there was no data protection law, people's fingerprints were taken, uh, the whole system of registering uh, and voting was all based on biometrics without any protection for people. I think it's a good example of doing one part of the equation but not the other and how it exposes people to risk. Uh, and since then, the Kenyans have adopted a data protection law, so that's good news, uh, even though there's still debate about you know the merits of the law. But this is just one example, and I think um, even in countries that are openly supporting universal human rights that have laws on the books, there are big challenges with regard to how AI impacts the protections of these rights. I mean, non-discrimination is pretty much anchored in laws across democratic societies, but AI poses profound challenges to the respect for non-discrimination principles because researchers at this university agree that they almost always discriminate illegally, that there is bias inherent in the system. So. Um, some of the challenges come also from the way AI operates mm -hmm. uh, and then play out differently in contexts where there are some kind of rights protection versus no rights protection. So we're, we're getting a lot of questions online. I want to op open up to people in the room, but let me ask one last one uh, based off something that we got online, which is, uh, to paraphrase, hasn't Europe solved this? Uh, which is to say that, that the Europeans, uh, so the AI Act is in some ways the, you know, the first one in, as you were saying. And if the Brussels effect is gonna take hold uh, in other tech regulation domains, maybe this is an example of that. So is it possible that, that um, you know, the recommendations that you're gonna come up with are basically gonna just sort of be wind in the uh, back of the sails of the, of the European efforts to do regulation? Unless maybe there are things about the AI Act that you think need to be improved given the concerns that have come up through this uh, body. Um, I haven't really thought of it this way, which is kind of ironic for a European uh, who used to be a lot. You've gone maker. native here in Silicon <laughs> Valley, you know, so you're a Californian now. Yeah, or gone native in the in the truly global outlook that this uh, UN body takes. And and there's a real trend uh, that I hear from people who live in in the global south that they're just not interested in copying regulation from elsewhere. They want it to be bottom up. They want it to be uh, anchored in local uh, traditions. Uh, politics, deliberations, and so on. Um, I'm not sure, I also am not sure in, in the other uh, challenge of competition between governments, how eager other governments are to follow the EU. So there may be a ripple effect in the sense that governments around the world will be looking to the first legally binding law to see what they can take, sometimes cut and paste, leaving out some really good parts taking some mediocre parts or vice versa, uh, or saying that they're basing it on the EU AI Act, as we've seen with the general data protection, but not in effect doing that. So I think we have to be critical also of you know, what this so-called Brussels effect um, might look like. But no, I haven't really uh, heard in the advisory body to, to go that direction, uh, no. Daphne. Um, I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about AI and climate impact. Uh, it seems like it's, it's easy to hear opinions ranging from like building out AI as the last suicidal gesture before the apocalypse to only AI can save us now and somewhere in between I assume is, is uh, a more nuanced position. So w what are your thoughts on that? So these are my personal thoughts. <laughs> um, I think it is absurd that there are no 
binding rules on metrics and standards with regard to the environmental impact of AI. Uh, when, or tech more broadly, I should say. So when a tech company bids uh, for, for land, for an energy contract, for water use, for a data center, it can pitch. If it convinces the local and the national government and gets a permit, great. Uh, if it decides not to report on its, its resource use, it gets away with it. And so we basically depend on the proactive transparency of companies to understand how much resource use they have. And because it's so individualized too, you know, there might be a data center in, in Iowa and one in Denmark and then another one in, in the Netherlands, it's almost impossible to do the math and to come to a, a good summary of what resource use is there, not only today, but also tomorrow, because there are endless amounts of permits already in the pipeline where you know, the green light has been given, but the data center isn't there. And so uh, I would be a big fan of standardizing uh, measurements and transparency requirements to, to even begin to get a sense. Now there's another vision uh, on climate and AI, which is that AI can help solve the climate crisis by being more efficient in anything from the use of pesticides to predicting, you know, um, uh, weather events or needs of certain communities for food or, uh, you know, certain resources. So um, if you want to look at AI and climate in a comprehensive way, then there are many different perspectives where it's harder for me to assess the merit of the predictions of the positive impact that AI will have on climate change but it's certainly a promise we hear a lot. And so if you look at the interim report of the UN AI advisory body, just bringing it back to there, you will see a case study on you know, how, how AI can be useful and the promise that along with uh, solving climate challenges, scientific discovery is a real opportunity to look at uh, with, with the ambition of advancing you know, human lives, quality of human lives around the world. So, um, as far as the advisory body is concerned, there's, there's definitely um, a strong push to, to look at the opportunities, but also to avoid missed opportunities. It's language that you will see a lot now in global governance discussions where people want to make sure that the benefits of AI can actually be reaped, including by these communities that may not necessarily do so. So uh, no one answer either. Over here. Without, without uh, UN action, do you think there would be a global race to the bottom, essentially, in AI regulation? Uh, in the sense that there will be deregulation, uh, global competition between regulators, and you seem to sort of imply that you wanted to see those principles as a minimum floor of harmonization. Yet the EU thinks to think the opposite. They, they think that there will be a race to the top, right? Essentially, they take a first mover approach and hope that others will follow the example and might even impose stricter regulation in the future. So which of the two do you think is the more likely scenario? So I, I don't think we see a traditional race to the bottom because we see so much governance activity. Um, a race to the bottom might mean that governments seek to be hands-off, as they have been for a long time with tech governance, let the markets lead to the best outcomes. We've heard the promise that leaving tech alone would lead to democratization, benefits for all. Well, you know, wake-up calls have, have brought us to where we are today, and nobody or well, few people believe that anymore. Um, so I think part of the whole response by governments around the world of very different political uh, convictions to be so quick to want to govern AI is because that appreciation for being too late for under regulating has really sunk in and combined with the enormous promise of this being a systemic technology you know everything we hear from the companies that it will solve uh, cancer climate change uh, lead to incredible scientific discoveries you know that the promises are also enormous national security concerns are enormous so the the combination of lessons learned with under-regulating and the specific anticipation of what, what AI will, will be and uh, lead to in the future have led to um, engagement by governments, but of course it will be different. And I wish we could see highly ambitious, globally supported human rights standards around AI governance, but I'm also not naive. So if it can be a bottom line, I would be happy if it applies globally because 
name one issue where the world can agree anymore these days. You know, we live in a very fragmented, very polarized, very competitive world. We live in very polarized communities ourselves. It is hard to get to agreement. So if that can be done, I think it would be an enormous result. Not because it is my greatest ambition, but I think because in today's world it would be a great achievement. And then sure, the EU has already gone over uh, that bottom line ambition, but there will be other countries that need to be dragged along. And where if there is some kind of global standard that makes it easier to just join for companies in, in those communities or for participating in this global process, then great. You know, it may just kind of pull them up to where they may never um, aspire to be themselves. Well, so uh, let, let me ask the China question in, in a different way there then, that w which is, um, you, you know, th th this is the thing I'm, tr I'm trying to wrap my head around, not, not with your presentation, but generally when you think about uh, governance of this family of technology, is because, you know, for, Nuclear weapons, plutonium is easier to, to track, and, and you know the, working through the nation states made a lot of sense. And um, here you've got so many different actors that we're talking about. Um, and so, as we think about what would be, I don't want to say binding, but standards that that that, that might apply here um, for a technology where it's going to be sometimes hard to draw a line between the, the impacts and maybe the progenitor of the technology sometimes. Um, what do you think, wh what does is, what is an agreement look like? I, I, I'd say this is, I don't want to say it at the broadest level, but, but like just, just your intuition, where say China, the EU, and the US could get on board with a set of basic sort of binding standards that would apply both to government uses of AI and then also um, regulation of companies. Um, I don't know if it would go into that level of detail. Let, 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 hmm. me, put, let me maybe put it, uh, uh, be very specific. For governments that want to use AI for surveillance, mm -hmm. um, is that going to be a kind of deal breaker in a human rights based approach that comes out of the UN um, that, that, that would regulate AI? So I imagine no, because even in this high standard EU AI Act, AI for surveillance is still um, permitted, yeah. be it in restricted national security needed rule of law anchored processes. Right to the chagrin of a lot of civil society organizations and human rights activists, I should add. I mean, lots of people were not happy with this. But so, you know, if it's permissible under uh, mm. the AI Act, then I think it'll be really hard to imagine that other jurisdictions will say, well, we're gonna do away with it. But if the US mm. is so inclined, I think there would be a lot, a lot of happiness around the world and, and same with China. Um, but I think if, if this kind of use for surveillance is um, framed in limited use cases with oversight uh, and transparency, for example, or you know um, restrictions on how data can be processed, retained, et cetera, who has access to it, then it would be a step forward from where we are today. And I, I think sometimes that is unfortunately the only way to measure impact is to look at where we are today, which is a largely unregulated space with highly impactful technologies that are being used for anything from surveillance to, you know, advertising uh, optimization or um, uh, keeping people hooked to their screens to uh, disinformation in the context of, of elections or everyday um, uh, internet uh, information curation. So we are in a place where technology is still very underregulated. Here comes the AI wave that in some ways puts on steroids some of these discussions, including the harms. And so um, if we can get to a better place, I think it would be progress. Would I be su super happy as a person? No, but do I think we're moving somewhere in the right direction? That's kind of how I look at what the UN could potentially do. Hopefully make a move in the right direction for many people around the world. Great, over here. Would you have any advice for founders who want to build their companies with human rights in mind from the beginning? It's a broad question, so it depends a lot on the product. Um, but um, to embrace that as a foundational ambition would be really wonderful. 
um, but it translates to the handling of data, to the assessing for outcomes of whichever AI product or service is designed, to um, corporate governance questions like how much independent oversight and expertise does one bring in, um, does the company support uh, regulation of a democratic government, does it put limitations on itself for operating in different countries or does it just go where the money is? I think there are plenty of opportunities to self-start uh, depending on your product. I don't know if you are a founder uh, with a product, so maybe we can talk about it more. <laughs> so there are lots of questions that we've got uh, online. Let me start with this one, which is with on from, um, oh, I just lost it, but um, from uh, Eduardo Paredes. Uh, with ongoing conflicts such as in Ukraine and other global hotspots, how are military governance and AI and defense being addressed within the UN's uh, AI governance discussions? Are there specific frameworks or guidelines being developed to regulate AI applications in military contexts? It's a great question, a hot topic as well. We have not addressed it as much in the body yet, and I hope we will. Okay. Um, Caroline uh, Friedman Levy asks, she very much appreciated your recent op-ed in FT on the need to consider an AI tax uh, aimed at ensuring companies share in social costs in contrast to the global failure to account for costs um, in other areas. Have you found any appetite for this conversation in global governance? Um, it hasn't been a part of the, the global governance discussion, but I did actually get a remarkable amount of feedback on that column. Why don't you tell, tell people what, what you were saying there? I was yeah. basically saying, <clears throat> research, whether it's from private companies like uh, Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or from the International Monetary Fund, indicates that disruptions of labor, thanks to the uptake of artificial intelligence, will be, you know, enormous. Uh, not just job losses, but just job displacement, the need for reskilling. Um, IMF talks about 40% of jobs in the world impacted, not all uh, made redundant, but still 40% of jobs impacted. Uh, if unemployment reaches 5%, <clears throat> that's an incredible uh, economic impact. It has social reverberations, political reverberations, and I just do not see governments preparing. Recently, uh, at the start of this year, uh, a large number of countries in the world have agreed to a minimum global corporate tax base. It took seven years, I think, to negotiate. So the, the column I wrote basically said, start thinking about an AI tax now before it's too late. Uh, because there's such high concentration of capital, such major uh, anticipated social, economic, and political uh, ripple effects, and one way to redistribute is through taxing, so I, I don't think it's a revolutionary thought at all. <laughs> it's just uh, one that pisses some people off if it's the revenue of their company that is to be redistributed, and uh, for others it's a logical step that governments can take. So I, th this again goes back to my um, sort of grappling with whether the tech model that we've seen in the age of social media and Web2 uh, is the right one to bring to bear with um, AI. And that is, so So right now, yes, it looks like we've got OpenAI and Meta and all the big players are the ones who are, who are also in the AI space, but it's there's gonna be these this long tail of AI companies, right, that are these smaller ones, and, and even defining what an AI company is, is, is gonna be quite difficult. And so, as you think about the, the regulatory environment, are you mainly thinking about it as regulating big corporations and maybe governments, you know, that, and was a regu you know that, that, that standards for them, or are you thinking about it in a, in a kind of different way? Um, do, you see, do you understand where I where I'm totally coming understand. From? Yeah. Um, I think impact matters, but there are small companies that can have a very deep impact. Let me take the example yeah. of surveillance tech that I have, you know, spent much more time on than I ever dreamt I would. You know, small or relatively small companies have intelligence grade capabilities that can go after judges, journalists, opposition politicians, uh, compromising their devices, their personal information, their everyday moves without needing to even send a phishing email. These are small companies with huge impact, and I'm sure there will be equivalents in the AI space. There already are, for example, um, uh, emotion or facial recognition technologies that are that are very specific. 
um, used in a context where there's no protection for people's rights, such as in China, uh, I think are problematic. They're not necessarily big, big tech. Uh, of course, if you look at the economic impacts specifically, then the high concentration of capital and investments going into the big AI companies uh, is different from the smaller ones. So when you look at taxation, it's often progressive, meaning that uh, those who are more wealthy, the same goes for citizens, pay more uh, than, than those who are not. And so I, I imagine that with any thinking about redistribution, those who have the most would have to redistribute the most. So yes, depends on the problem we're trying to tackle. So here's a question from Yves uh, Tibergian. He uh, says, is the UN report also attempting to deal with the one sentence statement on existential risk from the March 2023 st uh, uh, statement that we all know about? Um, uh, warning on existential risk of uh, AGI uh, unaligned with human values. So it's a lively discussion within advisory body too. Uh, we haven't escaped it. And um, one of the, the directions of thought is now, can we create a trusted risk assessment process? So we're not gonna say what risk others are to take the most seriously, because for one entity it may be existential risk, for others it may be uh, risk to vulnerable communities today, like patients in hospitals or uh, the underprivileged or um, uh, ethnic minorities or indigenous populations, for example. But if the UN can play a role in creating capabilities to assess models for risk in a way mm -hmm. that is trusted around the world, then hopefully we can also break through some of these, uh, I think, at some point almost unhelpful tribal yeah. discussions that may also blur people's scientific vision, right? If people are so entrenched in the positions they've taken through signing letters, through uh, defending that they truly believe that risk A or risk B is the greatest, then are they capable of moving along with how the technology moves along and recognize that, well, maybe they were a little bit wrong or maybe they just missed uh, one aspect or the other. So I'm personally also in favor of the most sort of honest analysis of these models rather than defending one camp over the other. I see Jamie O'Connell back there. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Picking up on Nate's question about the value of a human rights framework. So everybody claims they're in favor of human rights. Can you hold the mic up? Yeah. Everyone claims they're in favor of human rights, including the full range of governments. But obviously, there's a great deal of lip service there. And furthermore, human rights norms are often fa phrased in very vague broad terms, so there's also a lot of disagreement about the specific content of the norms. Given that, would you say that international human rights law and norms still provide the most broadly accepted and legitimate framework for AI regulation? That was something I was thinking you might say to Nate, but didn't hear, and I was wondering if you felt it was just too much disagreement. No, I think it's a great question. Um, how I personally see this is any agreement around human rights that we can build on top of is better than starting a new process that would have to begin to define human rights today. Because the world will never get to the same kind of agreement that it had when the UN Charter was signed. So it's also a pragmatic way of looking at it because I wish everybody claims that they uh, support human rights. Not so much. There are uh, lots of people who say that you know, human rights need to be redefined, that maybe we need to talk about um, the companies defining you know, what, what good practices are, not so much government. So I actually think that the legitimacy of human rights as such is under enormous pressure, and um, I personally believe that that will go into a downward spiral. So what we can uphold by implementing, by innovating, by enforcing, and really living in terms of human rights pr uh, um, protections, also in new contexts, like in the context of interacting with AI, uh, is good compared to the alternatives. Um, my question concerns process. Um, it seems to me that when we have these kinds of discussions, it's very easy to focus on objectives, what are your objectives on um, interests, national interests, even on principles, whether they be human rights or anything else. And often no attention is given to the question of process. What is the process that is being used to try to make forward movement? Um, and it seems to me that uh, having been a diplomat, for example, one of the risks in diplomacy is summit diplomacy. You know, nothing can happen 
until heads of government stand up and say something. So you mentioned a kind of slightly farcical almost uh, event back in the UK last year when you had these competitive... Were you a UK diplomat? Uh, I was a UK diplomat, <laughs> yes. So I, I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> um, so I, I'm wondering whether you could say a bit about the process you're involved in. Who is actually taking part? Who are the 39 people? Um, and is it, as I suspect, the case that you were able to produce a report in a month precisely because this is a group of people who, although you yourself have had your hand on the policy lever in the past, you do not any longer, uh, that this is a group of people who do not have their hands on policy levers and probably don't have their hands even very close to policy levers. And finally, it seems to me one could look at examples such as the CSE be that became the OSCE, how that made uh, forward movement. One could look at the Oslo process, for example, that failed um, uh, ultimately. Uh, the point was these were people who didn't have their hands on the policy lever, either because they were academic kinds of folks, and this is where a great contribution can be made by all of us, perhaps here now, or because they were government officials, but they were so junior that they were a long way away from making decisions. So could you say a bit, are there Chinese members in the 39? There must be, and what's the sort of interpersonal dynamics of yeah. your discussion? Great question. Uh, all the members are public. I don't know all their names by heart, but there are some that represent big AI companies, some that represent governments, some that represent, uh, that are previous government officials, academics, um, civil society, um, sort of independent experts, like there's one one member that focuses very much on sort of the, the cultural aspects of the use of technology, including AI. Uh, so I would say it is quite broad if you compare people between themselves. Are there many young people? No. Uh, are most people privileged in their own context? Yes. You know, highly educated, access to these kinds of communities. Although, in terms of process, it was an open call for applications, which I think is, you know, to the credit of the UN, because apparently they got thousands of people who applied. Um, governments could also nominate experts, so they probably selected a mix of people who were nominated by governments and uh, who self applied. But I think the idea that it was an open call was good. Um, then, process within uh, the body, there are people with policy expertise. The Secretariat, of course, knows the UN policy process best, which is the, the restricted context within which we have to operate. Uh, so I'm not an expert on the UN, even though I've been a policymaker for 10 years. What I really appreciate is that the UN Secretary General has told us from the beginning, be bold. And so the phase we're in now, and I think we're about to tip, is that we're not hindered by anticipated restrictions of the UN system. And I think that that's really helpful because if you're gonna think about only what is feasible, then you're automatically going to limit your options. The spirit, which you asked about within the advisory body is one of a sense of momentum, a sense of urgency and a sense of responsibility, I would say. And that is something I've really appreciated because people feel like we must do this well and of course there's a back and forth about you know, what is good and what is bad and which perspective should prevail. But I have been very positively surprised. I went, uh, went into this process with a healthy dose of skepticism. I've been positively surprised, but I think the challenge will be to keep this positive momentum alive as pressures intensify, which they undoubtedly will, and as big decisions have to be made. I mean, we have articulated a sense of direction, a number of principles, that is the quote unquote easy part, even though it was not necessarily easy, but you know, it's harder to say in detail, how is it gonna be operationalized? How is there gonna be accountability? Who is to be responsible? Who should pay? I mean, this is where it all gets uh, muddier, but I think if we can keep up at least the spirit that we've operated under, then that's the best effort we can make. So we're almost out of time, but I, I want to use the last minute for a book promo for you because I, I think Thanks, we, need, Nate. we need to, I, I didn't even uh, get your permission for this, but uh, Maricha has a book coming out on, on, on tech governance, which will be out, well, tell us, you know, when it's gonna be out and who's playing me in the movie, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, 
Um, <laughs> I thought this was a serious seminar. Yeah. Okay, so um, the book is called The Tech Coup, and it is about the privatization of governance of technology and how it hurts democracy. It will be out in September uh, at Princeton University Press, and um, I hope you'll all read it, and I hope maybe I get to, to talk about it during a webinar or Absolutely. seminar again. Absolutely, so come back in September uh, for that webinar, uh, but please join me in, wel in, in thanking Amri Shashake. Ne next week, we've got our own uh, Ronald Robertson, who's going to be talking about disentangling user choice and algorithmic curation in online systems. So I hope uh, to see you here next week. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful.